Hi-ho from Baden Hill. Well, we're at our fourth installment of our post-colonialism unit, and it's time to talk again about Vietnam. Why do we focus on Vietnam? You know, when we're studying world history, why do we choose a fairly small nation as one of our five segments each unit? And the reason is because it's become such a big part of American culture and American identity. Uh, first of all, we have many, many Vietnamese immigrants in our country, in the United States. And this is directly related to the, the difficult situation in Southeast Asia and particularly Vietnam during the period uh, after World War I and then all the way until the period after World War II. And, you know, as things were unsettled in French Indochina, uh, people would eventually emigrate. They would leave Vietnam and come to the United States. And a big part of this happened when uh, the French came back to Vietnam. And so that's going to be our story as we talk about Vietnam because we are focusing on post-colonialism and part of that has to include the story of the, the, the French leaving Vietnam, at least not having power over Vietnam. And that happened because the Japanese took their power. And this shows just how messy post-colonialism is. Often when one colonial power is driven out or is somehow uh, caused to let go of their colony, another power comes in and takes their place. And, you know, if it's not foreign powers coming in and controlling a, a country or an area, then it's rival factions. It's two groups or multiple groups in that area who are now trying to fill the vacuum. Remember, when some when something leaves, when power leaves, there's a vacuum created and someone else has to fill that vacuum. So let's talk again about Ho Chi Minh. And, uh, you know, you can say his name in, in Chinese too, and it's Ho Zhi Ming. Ho Zhi Ming. Actually, his last name, his last, the, the, the last part of his name, which is actually the second part of his given name. Okay, like my given name is Corey. And my family name is Baden. Remember that in Southeast Asian culture, you have the last name first. And so uh, Ho would be his last name, his family name. And Jermin, Jerming, uh, or Chi Min, that is his given name. Remember that he was a man with many names, and so this is really an adopted name. And the last part of that, the Min, or in Chinese, Ming, is the same as my my given name in Chinese. My Chinese name is Dai. Dai Ming Yi. Ming, it means brightness. It has, in the Chinese character, you have sun and moon written next to each other. Okay, sun and moon. And that means uh, brightness, logically, right? So it's a picture that, that uh, shows the meaning. Um, so Ho Chi Minh, also was nicknamed by his own people. He was called Uncle Ho. So let's call him that for now. And you can see that that relationship makes him someone who is trusted, someone who is related to everybody in, in that group of people in that country. And someone who maybe was gentle. Uh, that That is how he's perceived. So Uncle Ho, why was he perceived this way? Why was he nicknamed Uncle Ho? Because from the beginning, he was a champion of poor people, and this comes from his upbringing. Uh, even though his his father had been well educated and had been an, an official in the government, uh, remember that he his father remained uh, opposed to French rule and connected to traditional Vietnamese values. And um, you know, there were people who went along with the French who became very rich, and so. You have uh, someone like Ho Chi Minh's father who would have seen the corruption and who would have resisted that. 
Uh, and so also Ho Chi Minh was connected with his father and the the love of traditional Vietnamese culture. I'm saying this because it's similar to Gandhi. Gandhi was definitely connected to poor people, even though he had a very uh, well-educated, elevated status. He cared about people even like the untouchables, and he related to traditional culture. And so Ho Chi Minh is a Vietnamese counterpart of that. He was also, because of this and his beliefs, he was a communist insurgent. And this developed as he saw revolutions taking place. You know, the ideas of Sun Yat-sen had taken uh, hold of China. And he, uh, Ho Chi Minh spent a good amount of time in uh, Guangzhou, which was called Canton. Remember Canton? That was the doorway into China for all the foreign companies and, and ships coming into the country back in the 1800s. Well, uh, so China had many revolutionaries who were mixing together and Ho Chi Minh joined that group eventually. And so it, it's this is fascinating because he actually attended, uh, I should say he, he was a teacher at the academy that was run by Jiang Kai-shek. So they knew each other very, very well. And they actually were on the same side. And I've already mentioned with my video on China how the communists and the nationalists, the, the KMT, the revolutionaries uh, on both in both parties, they were mixed together. And so uh, someone like Jiang Kai-shek was actually recommended by uh, the Comintern. Comintern was an organization that was the Communist International. And it was a group that cross borders and was trying to uh, get people uh, having a revolution in whatever country they lived in, an international revolution. And so Chiang Kai-shek was mixing with these communist leaders and Ho Chi Minh was one of them. And so Ho Chi Minh gave lectures on socialism at the military academy. It was called Wampua, and that's a dialect. I mean, that's how it was written originally, but it's actually Huangpu. Okay, in Mandarin. I finally found out how to say it in Mandarin. And so Huang Pu was the military academy. Again, Jiang Kai-shek was the commandant of that academy. And Ho Chi Minh was one of the lecturers up through, you know, 1926. So, uh, he was a communist insurgent, and that means that he was, you know, rising up against the, the corrupt governments, the colonial governments, wherever he could. But as World War II started, things were kind of changing dramatically. First of all, France uh, was def quickly defeated by the Nazis. And in 1940, uh, the Japanese filled the vacuum. And so in Vietnam, you had the French who were allowed to stay as a colonial government. And they were basically puppets of the Nazis controlled by Vichy France. The Vichy government was sympathizing or co collaborating with the Nazis. And so that's what was going on with the French. But the Japanese now are the power and they basically ignore the French. They don't really want to run Vietnam. They want to keep uh, a they want to keep China from getting supplies And Vietnam and the railroad that went through Vietnam was one of the key uh, military uh, positions that needed to be overcome and conquered by the Japanese. And so the Japanese, they, they uh, came into Vietnam and they let the French continue to rule there. So back to Ho Chi Minh. During this time, Ho Chi Minh, he understood that the Japanese were there and he didn't want the Japanese there. And he also didn't want the French there. Eventually, he actually worked together with this, what was the, the OSS, and that later became the CIA. So he worked with an American named Archimedes Patty. Arch Archimedes Patty was a CIA agent, and Ho Chi Minh worked together with him. And what's fascinating is he was sick at the time. And so the OSS was the CIA. The OSS had a doctor, and Actually, that doctor treated Ho Chi Minh. He, he might have died otherwise. So this is a, a very important 
a kind of crossroads of history to understand that Ho Chi Minh was basically healed by a CIA doctor in April 1945. And um, when the, you know, the Japanese, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but basically the Japanese finally got rid of any sort of French leadership. And then when they were defeated uh, in, you know, August of 1945, uh, that left Ho Chi Minh ready to fill the vacuum. Remember, the Japanese are now leaving with their power. And so Ho Chi Minh and his organization, his political organization and also military called the Viet Minh, they were going to fill the vacuum. But he was apparently committed to democracy. Now, we don't know. We can't say how committed. But we can say that he believed that Thomas Jefferson was right, that we should have equality for all people, that colon, colonization, colonialism should be uh, outlawed. And uh, so this is a fascinating history that we need to confront, this post-colonial history that where you still have uh, this uh, question, who's going to rule and who's going to be in power? So now we're going to talk about how things changed. In this segment, it might seem like we're backtracking a little bit. What I wanted to do in that last section was focus on Uncle Ho and his changing role as, you know, a revolutionary and a mercenary who worked with other countries to overthrow their governments, was, you know, basically paid to do that. Uh, one thing to mention is, you know, Ho Chi Minh actually betrayed uh, Fan Boy Chao. That's the, the story for a few thousand dollars because he needed money to start the current Communist Party. So Fan Boy Chao, remember, uh, he was a revolutionary. He wanted to get rid of the French. Uh, and he was actually a friend of Ho Chi Minh's father. So this is pretty extreme betrayal. Uh, and... Later on, he said he did it because he wanted all the Vietnamese people to be really angry at the French uh, because Phan Boi Chao had been, uh, you know, arrested by the French. But it was Ho Chi Minh who basically ratted him out. Kind of a Judas moment, I guess. So... Let's, let's talk again about the Japanese aggression during World War II. It seems like everybody, all these foreign countries, are trying to get a piece of Vietnam or have control of Vietnam. And Japan, remember, they didn't really want to control Vietnam. They just wanted to keep the Chinese from getting, getting supplies, and eventually they wanted to control China. Well, during the, the time of Japan's occupation of Vietnam, they called Vietnam the empire of Vietnam. Again, their idea is let's, let's continue to have this puppet government, the empire of Vietnam. And uh, it eventually, you know, that, that fell apart at the end because Japan was defeated. And so the empire of Vietnam ceased to be. Uh, the, the main thing then is Japan fighting against the Republic of China, which was the name of China. Remember, the Republic of China eventually had to flee. The government fled to Taiwan, and that's where it is to this day. Uh, and Japan, they just wanted to close off the railroad. It was actually the railroad to Kunming, and that's, you know, uh, it was a strategic move for Japan to take over Vietnam to keep China from getting supplies. And at this time, Japan was basically ignoring the French government, the Vichy French colonial government in Indochina. And uh, the uh, so the Vichy French colonial officials alongside the Imperial Japanese Army, we'll call them the IJA. So Vichy France, IJA, they're working together. Now remember, Vichy France, they were basically working with the Nazis, so it's not so strange that you'd have 
an ally of the Nazis working together with the Japanese. They were both Axis powers during World War II. Uh, but ultimately, the Japanese got tired of the French toward the end of the war, uh, and they uh, created a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat is when the military takes over the political government, right? And this is a term that we should, we're going to use a lot, especially during the post-colonial period when we talk about Africa next. And so this coup d'etat made a new government and it was very short-lived. It didn't last very long. Now, what happened uh, at the end of World War II that changed everything? Well, let's let's go back again and let's talk about two conferences that basically are a part of the end of World War II. The first one is the Potsdam Conference in Germany, and it happened in uh, spring of 1945. And it, it was basically an agreement among the allies, and the allies are Britain, and the United States and uh, Russia is a part of that group and China is a part of that group and also you have France even though France is occupied by the Nazis they're still allies and eventually you know they they would get back their power and they would re they would return to their colonies so at the Potsdam conference it was agreed that Chiang Kai-shek uh, that the Republic of China would take control of the northern part of uh, Vietnam, basically north of the 17th parallel. So the 17, 17 degrees latitude, right? And so um, what, what happened was that uh, Ho Chi Minh, at, at the very moment when Japan surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, Ho Chi Minh declared the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And remember, that's the DRV. The DRV was declared at that moment to fill the vacuum. And it was recognized by the Republic of China. So this is, again, Chiang Kai-shek's China, and also by the USSR. Uh, this is this is really interesting because the other countries of the world did not recognize the DRV, even though uh, Ho Chi Minh sent a telegram directly to uh, the president at that time, who was uh, uh, Harry S. Truman. Harry Truman received a telegram from Ho Chi Minh, basically begging him to intervene and keep the French from reoccupying their colony. And honestly, uh, you know, Roosevelt, Truman, they didn't really want the French to go back in to Indochina. Uh, the French had not been super cooperative, uh, especially with General Charles de Gaulle. There was a lot of uh, friction between the French and the British and, you know, the other allies. And so, you know, that's really interesting that, um, you know, what's, what's going to happen at the end of this war? Who's going to get Vietnam? You also need to know about the surrender of the Japanese to the Allies. And uh, General MacArthur demanded, this is the U.S. General, General MacArthur, he demanded that he personally receive the Japanese surrender aboard the USS Missouri, the battleship Missouri, and that was going to be in Tokyo Harbor. The thing is, it was supposed to happen in the middle of August, but um, there was a typhoon. And so because uh, MacArthur demanded that he be personally present, that left about three weeks, two, three weeks, where the Japanese had basically lost control and then the Viet Minh uh, were going to fill the vacuum and create a situation where uh, there was unrest and there was fighting. So basically, if MacArthur had agreed to have that truce earlier and, and 
if he had said, it's okay if I'm not present, then things would have been very different because those two and a half weeks allowed the Viet Minh, the, basically the communist Vietnamese revolutionaries led by Ho Chi Minh, it allowed them to create their Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And then that was going to create a very bad situation when the French wanted Vietnam back, when the French wanted Indochina back. And so we have a familiar person who's involved in this story. His name is Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten, the same guy who basically was the last viceroy of India before the partition and everything broke apart in India. Well, Lord Mountbatten was involved in the British that came to occupy uh, Indochina after the Japanese left. Remember, the Chinese were in the north, but the Chinese did not want to stay, even though uh, Roosevelt supposedly said to uh, Chiang Kai-shek, you know, you can take Vietnam. And Chiang Kai-shek said, no way, under no circumstances. Probably he realized what a mess that would have been. Uh, but the Chinese did send 200,000 troops to control the northern part, North Vietnam, uh, after the Japanese uh, were defeated. So you have Lord Mountbatten and the British who come to the south. So Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese are supposed to govern the north, and Mountbatten and the British are supposed to govern the, the south, along with their buddies, the French. Okay, even though they're not really buddies, the French are the allies, and the British, remember, they have a lot of colonies. They can't just tell the French, you don't get your colony back, because they still want to keep some of their colonies, and so they allow their, their, their buddy French colonial partner to come back in. And uh, this leads to unrest and fighting. Uh, it's the basically a war from 1945 to 1946, and we will discuss that. Uh, basically, it's, it's unrest as the Viet Minh and their army are fighting against the French and their army, the, the army that they are controlling to, to regain control of Vietnam. And remember, Ho Chi Minh had pleaded with the president of the United States to keep this from happening, and it didn't work. Now, the main general that is involved in the Viet Minh Army, uh, it's it's called the Viet Vietnam Vietnamese People's Army, that was General Giap. General Giap is somebody we need to know. He's considered the Red Napoleon, red meaning communist. Napoleon, he emulated, he followed the teachings of Napoleon and also Lawrence of Arabia, remember him? And he learned how to be a general and, and to do strategy. Uh, and so General Giap uh, fought in the Battle of Hanoi against the French and their army. And uh, even though they didn't win a total victory, it took the French 60 days to finally regain control of of Hanoi. And so that's a critical uh, first battle of what would become called the First Indochina War. And remember that the Second Indochina War is what we think of as the Vietnam War. Now we'll talk about the First Indochina War really started with the Battle of Hanoi and General Giap's, uh, you know, fighting for uh, a free Vietnam against the French colonizers. But we need to also talk about the Vietnamese National Army. The Vietnamese National Army, I, this is very confusing, so you'll probably have to look back at the slides and try and figure out which is which. Just remember, the People's Army is usually communist, and that goes with the Viet Minh and Ho Chi Minh and General Giap. The VNA, the Viet Vietnamese National Army, was actually loyal to an emperor, the emperor of Vietnam, and he had been emperor since 1932. So they still have these emperors that are in the background. They're, they're kind of puppets to these other you know, militaries, like the French military and, co and colonial government and the Japanese military. And so you still have this emperor, and his name was Bao Dai. The Emperor Bao Dai was the last emperor of the Wen Dynasty in Vietnam. 
and his army was the Vietnamese National Army, basically fighting on behalf of the French colonizers uh, against the Vietnamese People's Army, the Vietnam People's Army. Well, uh, the, the 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 Vietnam Vietnamese People's Army eventually became the People's Army of Vietnam, P A V N, and. Um, there was a process then of purging non-communists from the territory that was held by the Viet, Minh, the Viet Minh, North Vietnam, essentially. So in North Vietnam and anywhere that the People's Army controlled, they were getting rid of non-communists. And so this is called a purge. A purge is when you get rid of things that don't belong. We need to recognize this happened in Vietnam and it happened most famously in Russia. The Great Purge is usually referring to what happened with the communists in Russia. So if you're not communist enough, they get rid of you. Now, um, eventually, everything led up from 1946 to 1954. In 1954, there was a very famous battle called the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Excuse me, Dien Bien Phu. Dien Bien Phu was the greatest battle of the first Indochina War and it was won and it ended by it was won by the people's army and ended that first indochina war and basically france had to give up at that point the french had to let go of their colony of indochina and uh, at the end of the war as often happens there were there was a meeting in geneva switzerland and so in geneva switzerland they had a meeting to decide who gets what how does this all work out this happened in 1954, and already communism had been uh, the cause of wars all over the world. In Africa, it happened, and also in fam famously in North Korea and South Korea. In Korea, the Korean War happened at the same time. And so the Geneva Conference has to sort out what's going to happen in Korea. And so they said, okay, well, there have to be elections to decide what happens in Korea. And that never happened. Okay. There were no elections. And so to this very day, we still have a state of war between North and South Korea. And it comes back to what didn't happen at the Geneva conference in 1954. The second order of business was to figure out what's supposed to happen in Vietnam now that the first Indo the Indochina war, remember they didn't know there was going to be a second one, what's going to happen to North and South Vietnam. So we need to know that Korea and Vietnam, they were actually happening at the same time. And a lot of times we don't understand that because it seems like the Korean war happened 20 years before the Vietnam war. Not true. They were really happening at the same time. And Vietnam just lasted longer and it kept going as a big mess. And you could say Korea did too, but at least there wasn't uh, outright fighting between North and South Korea. And there was still fighting between North and South Vietnam. Well, the United States and its allies rejected the Geneva Accords because the Geneva Accords were basically saying that the Viet Minh would get to keep the northern part of Vietnam and create the country of North Vietnam. And the United States saw this as communism spreading and the United States didn't want communism to spread. Uh, remember that maybe I haven't mentioned this in the videos, but the domino theory said that if one part of Southeast Asia falls, it's going to hit, in, hit another part and that will hit another part and pretty soon all of Asia will be communist if we don't stop communism. And so the United States rejected even the idea of democracy. So remember, the, the, the Geneva Accords said the Vietnamese people should be able to decide what happens in their country as a democracy. But there was always this idea that maybe this isn't real democracy and maybe it will just, they'll pretend that they have an election and then communist leaders will take over all of Vietnam. So the United States rejected. Finally, we need to address this idea of what happened after these accords. 
accord makes it sound like there was harmony and peace and an end to the problem, but it wasn't true with Vietnam. There were two new nations. There was the uh, North Vietnam, which was the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and there was South Vietnam, which was the state of Vietnam. Now, remember, Bao Dai had been uh, the emperor and was the leader of this southern part of Vietnam called the state of Vietnam. Well, another leader named Diem was very ambitious. And so what he decided is he would uh, he would create a fake election and there was fraud and Diem basically uh, declared that there would be a Republic of Vietnam and his ideas, his his supporters uh, said that there were 98% of the Vietnamese people that voted for this. So clearly this was a fraudulent election and we consider this a coup, another coup d'etat to overthrow the democratically elected government. Okay, so Vietnam had a democratically elected government and Diem messed with that and created a fake election and so he became the the president of this new Republic of Vietnam. Very confusing. The North is called the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The South is just called the Republic of Vietnam. And it's hard to say that either one of them was very democratic. Well, when the North was given their identity through the Geneva Accords, it meant that the communists were in power. The Viet Minh were in power. And remember, communists were known for getting rid of people, for purging people who did not agree with them. Remember, communism was atheistic. They did not believe in any god uh, officially. And so Catholics in Vietnam were under threat. And basically there was a mass exodus that began from the north to the south. And one million Vietnamese moved from the north to the south and many others settled in China or other places uh, where where they could live and not be threatened. And uh, political opposition parties were also fleeing because anybody who was against the communists had to get out of the country. This was known as Operation Passage to Freedom and the United States Navy uh, used their ships to rescue people to to get them out of communist North Vietnam. You can see that this is not going to end well and this is not the end of the story. Uh, but I hope you understand a little bit better. This is in the 1950s and the United States would continue to escalate. You know what an escalator does? It goes up slowly and this war would continue to escalate into the 1960s and even into the 1970s uh, and would become America's longest war. This hopefully isn't my longest video, but I know it, it takes a lot of patience to get through these details. Thanks for watching.